Hello, folks. Uh, so we are going to cover our first lecture of this week um, within the Intro to Ethnic Studies framework. Uh, you have been assigned an article by Miguel Zavala and Christine Sleater, our chapter of their book um, regarding ethnic studies uh, published last year. Um, and I'm going to expound a little bit on the history of ethnic studies in terms of um, what U.S. education looks like, um, kind of the issues within early U.S. education, some of the contemporary issues, what is the uh, kind of legal terrain around um, graduation policies, some of the impacts of these programs, and then you're actually going to see some uh, data points or my own research on this in terms of students in action, which I'll talk a little bit about um, how my dissertation or my doctoral research actually gives us some interesting evidence about the impacts of um, ethnic studies. So, uh, so we're again going to be thinking about the evolution of ethnic studies. It did not come from anywhere, um, but actually is born out of an activist tradition um, trying to fill uh, particular gaps in um, both K-12 education and university studies, um, particularly infusing the perspectives and ideas from BIPOC groups or communities of color into um, historical tellings and into, um, you know, this kind of intellectual musing. So, you know, thinking through sociology, anthropology, and those kinds of pieces, and then obviously um, filling in historical records where people of color have been um, left out or their stories have not been included. So um, points that we're going to be covering is the history of education, the rise of the ethnic studies movement, some of the tenets of ethnic studies, um, contemporary education issues, the modern movement for ethnic studies, and then lastly, ethnic studies in action. There, there are going to be two key terms that we learn about in this um, lecture, one being epistemology and critical race theory. Um, we will revisit critical race theory over and over throughout the course, um, but I did want to introduce it here as it will be a guiding theoretical concept for our class. Um, so one thing that we want to be considerate of is why, right? Why ethnic studies and why now? Okay, so what I want you to do is reflect on these questions and consider um, their salience as to what you're doing in this course, right? So one, why are you taking this course, right? Do you think ethnic studies is important? What do you think you will learn about in the course? And lastly, do you think it is important for other students and individuals to take these courses? And I want to be very clear that um, a lot of people come to ethnic studies from a variety of um, backgrounds and desires, right? Some people are ethnic studies majors. Some people need to take it for graduation requirements. And this could be both or either for you. Um, I myself uh, ended up taking more ethnic studies courses because I had taken a lot of race and ethnicity courses in sociology uh, when I was a sociology major. And I wanted to learn more specifically about the issues that my community, um, i.e. the Latinx community faced. And so through that, I actually changed my entire career goal. And I remember I was in a um, Chicano psychology course and the professor had shown the breakdown of um, individuals uh, in terms of degree or individual communities in terms of degree attainment. And Latinx and Chicanx individuals were pretty much at the bottom of the rung. And I'll talk about it a little bit later when we review the academic pipeline, but just know that um, there are very few PhDs and are very few Latinx individuals, male and or female, who hold PhDs, and it is a huge struggle to get here. And so I'm not trying to scare you off if you want to become a professor. It's actually a very rewarding career, and, I, and I'm actually very thankful for my career path. However, what we need to recognize is that um, I came out of a long battle to make more of me because my story and the stories of people like me who may reflect many of the people in this course and many of you who you know identify similarly as I do, we, are, we matter, right? Our stories matter and they need to be a part of 
academia, a part of textbooks, a part of K-12 education, um, so on and so forth. So first, we want to think about the historical context of education, and it's not a very good one. Um, education is one of the more um, nascent or newer um, institutions or social institutions in the United States. Um, we actually did not really care about education in the constitutional framework. And um, although there are interpretations of constitutional amendments that um, ensure you have the right to education, you actually do not have a uh, social contract or any particular right to education. And if you look at um, any of the uh, amendments in the constitution or the bill of rights, there is not one that specifically states that you have a right to education. There's interpretations of the 14th Amendment that ensure that you do. Um, however, there's not a constitutional mandate that says that you should have access to education or equitable education. Um, with that, um, that created a very um, stark contrast in terms of what education some folks had and what education other folks had. And namely, that um, white individuals in the United States up until today, which we'll talk a little bit about um, later on in this lecture, but white folks um, previously always had access to better schools, right? Um, uh, better resource staffed and um, you know, these more adequate facilities compared to um, people of color. Um, black and then native Mexican and Asian schools were all segregated and had very, um, similar characteristics. One being that they were, you know, usually crammed, that these classes were overwhelmed. Um, they had students of a variety of different ages all in the same classroom. And, um, the, and that was largely due because they were understaffed. Um, if you look here on the right, I've provided you four different pictures of different segregated schools um, on the top left you can see a Mexican school in New Mexico circa 1935. On the right, you can see the Carlisle Indian School, which is in Northern California um, with this you know, huge mass of indigenous students. Um, on the bottom left, you can see a Chinese school in Mississippi. Um, and in the bottom right, you can see a black school in Detroit. Um, some things you probably automatically notice uh, in three of the pictures is that there's a huge amount of students, right, in the Chinese school, the black school, and the native school. Um, indigenous sporting schools, if you're familiar, have um, garnered a lot of attention because of issues in Canada. Um, they recently found a mass grave of children at a, uh, near an Indian boarding school site uh, where I believe over 200 children or the remains of 200 children were found. Um, there were several indigenous schools here in the U.S. Um, they haven't done that kind of archaeological digging to see if there are similar um, cases of um, unidentified or of child death. However, it would probably be very likely. Um, obviously, with the Mexican school, alongside some of the other schools, they're very dilapidated, right? Um, the school in the bottom right, there's one teacher for, you know, what seems like two dozen um, Black children variety of ages, um, so on and so forth. Um, what was um, very um, distinct, but I will say not necessarily unique to um, the native Asian and Mexican schools was that they wanted to penalize what was their called their home culture, right? Or, you know, kind of um, civilize the quote unquote savage, if, you know, if you've never heard that mantra before, but essentially make all of these students who didn't speak English and didn't follow Christian traditions be essentially American. That wasn't necessarily needed to be done with black students, but that was largely because um, that had been done during the Chattel slavery period or you know, the early history of slavery in the United States. Um, many um, African um, civilizations and tribes you know, were obviously ripped from their land, brought here, um, forced to endure you know, horrific accounts of slavery, um, and literally had the African um, destroyed out of them in a lot of ways, right? And one, so what we want to understand in terms of this historical context is that the education that these students were provided with were not about trying to explore their individual identities, culture, so on and so forth. It was trying to comport them to be American, um, but did so in this way that really was about dehumanizing them, right? Like, 
their communities, their cultures, their individual histories did not matter. And really their education didn't matter that much. We'll try to make them American. If we do so, great. If not, whatever, right? Well, they'll end up being manual laborers for the most part or something else where it didn't really, ma uh, where it didn't really matter to the society, right? And what we've seen overall and time and again in education is that there's usually two tracks. One is we um, take folks of the dominant group, in this case, um, white Americans, and provide them all of the education and resources to ensure that they will, um, you know, be able to be successful. And with students of color, that has not been the case. And so what segregated education essentially wanted to do was reinforce this idea of white dominance, right? Whites go to good school and people of color go to crammed and poor schools. Um, this Americanization education or Americanizing education had four kind of central goals. One is a focus on English, right? And this um, standard by which we only understand English as the uniform language, despite the fact that obviously um, we are a nation of immigrants, we have a plurality uh, in a wide plurality, I'm sorry, of different languages represented in, in different school districts. Um, for example, where I was at in Riverside, uh, Riverside Unified School District had 23 different languages spoken, um, you know, within the home or within the parents and various families that were um, represented in the district. Um, it was all about parent, preparing students for the labor force, um, which was mostly man, manual labor, either agricultural or industrial. Um, many schools, um, particularly like those that served um, um, Mexican Americans during like the Bracero program, which we'll learn about when we go over um, Chicanx and Latinx studies, um, had uh, policies that during the harvest seasons, um, they would just basically allow students to leave school to go to work in the fields. Um, and it was never again about like ensuring that these folks were educated so that they could go on to college. It was mostly about providing them with the compulsory educated that they were legally required to only to the extent that, you know, they would check the box and otherwise they didn't really care. And then the other piece of this was reinforcing gender norms, right? So girls were prepared for the domestic world. Um, you may or may not have taken like a home ec class at some point in time. I took, actually took one in high school um, uh, and uh, or boys were kind of prepared for the labor world, right? So um, back in previous generations, my parents, for example, you know, there were auto shop, there was metal shop, there was wood shop. I believe there's still, you know, some kind of wood shop. We've seen this more in terms of what is now called CTE or career technical education that's been burgeoning. A lot of school districts that are predominantly are that predominantly house and or serve um, communities of color have huge CT programs, but they don't have the AP or the IB, I, you know, Advanced Placement and International Baccalaureate or other programs that would ensure that those students would go on to college, right? And so essentially, again, about it was, it was about comporting students to, you know, be English, be cisgender, you know, heterosexual and get them out to work, right? Um, where we saw that very differently for a lot of white students. So I want to show this video about the history of, of Latinx or Chicano education to really help um, uh, flesh out what this Americanization education looked like. Since the 1930s, Mexican-American students have had to face an education system that wanted to Americanize them, segregate them, and prepare them for vocational jobs. Mexican-American students were placed in vocational or industrial arts rather than college preparatory courses because they were not expected to continue on to higher education. Students were set low expectations before even given the opportunity to show their capabilities. Some even claimed they were unintelligent and unmotivated and did not encourage dropouts to return to school. Instead, they encouraged skilled labor. Segregation in schools strongly contributed to the educational inequity. Despite this, Los Angeles school officials were not concerned with the noted segregation because according to school officials, this was a community problem, which they were not responsible for. In 1947, the Mendez family organized to fight education segregation. The case Mendez versus Westminster was a first step to a political protest against the inequities in the education system in California. <laughs> 
The case banned separate and unequal schools. In the 1950s, a small Amer Mexican American middle class community began organizing to discuss education reform in East Los Angeles. However, despite their effort, little change occurred. But in the 1960s, a growing concern over Mexican American high school dropouts began to be exposed and re recognized. In 1960, the average dropout rate for 36 high schools in Los Angeles was 11%. While for the six minority schools, it ranged from twice to three times as many. In the early 1960s, Ruben Salazar, a prominent Los Angeles Times journalist, followed the Chicano community and educational crisis. In his article, Civic Leaders Troubled by School Dropouts, Salazar explains that Mexican Americans have the highest dropout rate out of any other group in Los Angeles. He gives us the story of Pablo, a high school dropout who says he quit school so he could work but the reasons were more complicated. Pablo says, what has algebra got to do with me? To me, algebra always seemed to belong to the gringo world. To Pablo, the curriculum was irrelevant because it belonged to the gringo world, which he could not connect with. Pablo could not see his reflection in that algebra book. Instead, he saw a world that he did not belong to, which pushed him to leave school. Salazar, explains that school administrators confirmed that the so-called dropouts are either encouraged or invited to leave school. These are not dropouts, they are kickouts. Without a doubt, Pablo was pushed out of school. The dropout rate may have scared civic leaders, but it was a group of students and a teacher, Sal Castro, along with the Brown Beret that united the Chicano student body. In 1968, students walked out of East LA schools and unleashed the Chicano movement. Students pitched 36 demands to the Los Angeles Board of Education. A critical demand was that textbooks and curriculum should be revised to show Mexican contributions to society, to show injustices that ha they have suffered and to concentrate on the Mexican folklore. Students knew that culturally relevant curriculum was important component in their education. Mexican-American students proved that they were not culturally inadequate, unintelligent, lazy, or passive, and instead exposed to discriminatory practices of the education system. The curriculum and educational policies were designed for European-Americans, not for Chicanos. Consequently, many Chicano students dropped out of high school since the high school system was designed to rid them of their culture and immerse them into white middle-class culture. Transiency and continues to be a huge problem in regards to high school dropout rates. A school administrator was quoted saying, our board policy is that any individual who is sufficient troublemaker so that he keeps others from learning must sometimes be sacrificed for the benefit of the class. But how many sacrifices were needed to fulfill this? And who was a troublemaker? If the combined transfers and dropouts approximate the average total enrollment in the school, there must be something wrong with the definition of a troublemaker. Students are deemed troublemakers and either removed from the classroom or removed from the school. These are not dropouts, they are kickouts. They are pushed out of school. Teachers and school officials find themselves blaming the Mexican American community in order to justify the high dropout rate. However, the community cannot be blamed for the inadequacy of the education system. Mexican-American culture has been defined as deficient and as not providing the skills to succeed in school. Instead of looking closely at the school system for its damaging effects on Mexican-Americans, the damaging culture theory is used to explain Mexican-American failure in schools, such as the dropout rate. However, studies have shown that Mexican-American culture, instead of hindering students, helps students do better academically and overall in life. Mexican-American culture is not deficient. On the contrary, it helps students do better in school. Schools should be creating an additive curriculum instead of a subtractive one. Student engagement has been connected with dropping out. But if students are not given relevant curriculum, this lack of engagement is caused by the school's failure to provide them with an additive curriculum and lack of authentic caring. Schools fail to engage students, consequently actively pushing students out. School mobility has also been attributed to high school dropout rates. However, if Chicano students are experiencing school mobility 
by changing schools because of involuntary withdrawal due to low grades, poor attendance, misbehavior, expulsions, or forced transfers, then the dropout rate should be attributed to school policies. Family background and parental involvement have also been connected to dropout rates. However, this may be oversimplified and instead be ignoring other factors that contribute to educational inequity, such as discriminatory practices. Schools are silencing the actual reasons behind the high school dropouts to protect and maintain the school system. Instead of helping, they're hindering the possibility to learn about ways of solving the high school dropout problem. Today, the Chicano dropout rate continues at alarming numbers. The Latino school age population is predicted to grow over the next 25 years. And while whites, Asian Americans, and Blacks have closer dropout rates, Latinos have a significantly higher dropout rate than any other group. Latinos have continued to have the highest dropout rate for over 50 years. Some of the same concerns and frustration during the 1960s persist today. Racial segregation in schools, high Latino dropout rates, underrepresentation in higher education, lack of relevant curriculum, school policies that push out students still exist today, demonstrating the urgency for educational reformers and for us to act. And so part of the reason why we we're in this class is to further explore this and address this. And, and one thing I will say um, a lot about this uh, particular um, um, issue is that we're seeing a consistent problem with students being able to connect with education. And this goes back to this idea of culturally relevant education. This has been this idea, um, this has been this idea of, of um, students having, um, uh, or not having access to material that engages with them or that they can connect with. And as a result, right, they don't identify with school. Um, and if they don't identify with school, they don't want to be in school, right? When your perspectives matter, when your identity matters to the school, um, you want to be there, right? And that's what we haven't seen for students of color, um, in this case, particularly Chicano and Latino students. But um, as you've seen with the pattern of education overall, um, BIPOC or community of color perspectives have not been a part of that curriculum. And as a result, right, we see these persistent issues of dropout and so on and so forth. So this set of issues, or sorry, and I want you all, um, you know, to kind of think like, have you experienced this, right? You're taking ethnic studies here at LBCC with me, you know, did you have access to cultural development education? In your history courses, did they talk adequately about women, people of color, so on and so forth? Were you, you know, penalized or criminalized because of your culture, because of your gender, because of your race, so on and so forth. And really think back, right? Like, is this something that is something brand new or as you know, the speaker suggested, something that's been a part of this long history of um, you know, discriminatory practices in our education system. So um, what we saw in the wake of the civil rights movement um, as particularly after the assassination of key figures like uh, MLK, uh, Malcolm X, JFK, uh, Bobby Kennedy, social movements and marginalized communities were still struggling for, for civil rights, right? We never really saw the actualization of um, the equity promises put forth by um, U.S. legislators. Uh, and so as these civil rights laws were not being enforced or, you know, nor guaranteeing that BIPOC communities had full inclusion and equity in American society. Um, essentially, you know, integration was slow and, and racist harassment was still persisting. We saw a new generation of civil rights leader consider different ways or new ways, essentially, to advocate for their communities. Uh, remember, the protesting is a great way to raise awareness, but it comes at an extreme personal cost. Um, even today, with you know, we see Black Lives Matter protests and other types of social movements um, for racial justice or for so, you know social justice more generally. That puts a lot of people in a weird um, predicament, right? And there's been a lot of issues of violence, both by police and by right wing extremists. And so we, uh, our community, started to consider different ways that they could 
essentially, you know, do this work in a way that wouldn't put their, you know, personal um, bodies at risk, right? So um, students at college campuses across the U.S. Um, started to develop this idea of what they would call the third world liberation front. And if you're not familiar with the third world, that's okay. Um, but the third world was this idea of um, people uh, in these various countries that were predominantly um, populated by groups of color, you know, um, uh, black people, um, Asian people, Latino people, so on and so forth, were a part of this historically marginalized um, group, right, that uh, the U.S. Um, essentially was colonized, right? Remember that many Western countries um, had colonies throughout Africa, throughout Latin America, the U.S. has constantly been messing around in parts of Latin America and um, um, the, the Arabias, right, or the Middle East uh, and parts of Asia. And so those folks abroad and here, or their, their related descendants um, in, and, and folks here, um, found this commonality of oppression, both domestically and internationally, and said, we are going to identify um, as a part of this, um, or, or this larger community of folks from the third world, and that we are going to now develop new ways to advocate for ourselves beyond just protesting in the street. So uh, these BIPOC youth went on to higher education in search of knowledge and research methodologies to collect data and develop new practices that would challenge systemic oppression. So these folks, you know, uh, essentially went on to universities and colleges with the explicit goal of figuring out ways to basically end oppression, you know, both uh, here in the U.S. and across the globe. Um, however, what they found in these university spaces was that most of these institutions still supported white ways of thinking, right? Like, um, in schools of education, they only wanted to tell the story of white men in U.S. history textbooks. Um, there was always a privileging of the old dead white men in English in terms of, you know, what was considered to be, you know, high literature, or high art. The sciences never really took into account indigenous perspectives, both from the Americas, Africa, so on and so forth. And so essentially these students continued their protests on campus and said, you know, we need to have these new departments, this third world studies department of this ethnic studies department out there so that we, we could have a space to create these new intellectual perspectives that were going to challenge the existing racist norms and ideas in our society. Um, and then obviously, you know, develop these ways of, um, of seeking liberation, you know. And so again, they came together, developed this idea of the Third World Liberation Front, uh, demanded ethnic cities teaching and research departments at schools and universities that could help these BIPOC communities throughout the world. And so um, Third World Liberation and these kind of new tenets of ethnic cities emerged. Um, we got to develop this idea of new epistemologies. And that's gonna be one of our key terms if you harken back to the, the layout of the course or the the guiding framework of the full course. So epistemology is this theory of knowledge, um, especially with regard to methods, validity, and scope. Um, what epistemology helps us do is really investigate what distinguishes a justified uh, belief from opinion. And another way to think about this is the way in which we perceive um, knowledge, right? And so when we're thinking about epistemology, we wanna think about it within political frameworks, for example, so maybe a, a liberal versus a conservative, maybe we want to think about it within certain cultural perspectives, all of those things. And so when you're understanding or trying to analyze how you may, uh, or think about how you might apply this, think about the ways in which we organize our society, right? So right now, we follow a very industrialist epistemology, right? So this idea that we are uh, uh, industrious, working, and, and always centered on work. And so um, you as adults, right, uh, structure many of the things that you do in your everyday life around maybe making money and maybe becoming more successful. Maybe you're here in a college classroom under the auspice of trying to better yourself, to get a better um, career in the long run, right? That's all a part of the way in which we see our social values, right, or this knowledge about what is successful in our society. So it's a way to think about epistemology. What ethnic study scholars wanted to understand is how our current 
theories of knowledge and theories about um, opinions and belief were structured within these sensibilities or these ideas of race and racism, right? And so they wanted to, to reveal, one, how power worked in our society, um, and then challenge it, right? To develop these new ways of thinking that would be much more inclusive. And this tree that you see here on the right, where ethnic studies comes from, from these various um, critical perspectives about cultural nationalism and uh, internal colonialism, Marxism, or you know, challenging capitalism, new forms of Marxism and feminism gave way to this idea of critical race theory, which we'll talk about next. And then it burgeoned out into these various uh, critical perspectives, i.e. Asian crit, um, femme crit, or a more gender uh, critical perspective, a Latino critical perspective, a native critical perspective, and even white crit. And there are many white scholars out there that are actually thinking about how their own status in society is privileged and trying to do the work to combat that or to, to um, make society much more equitable. Uh, and additionally, they are also exposing white supremacy in its various forms. Um, so the Third World Liberation Front gave rise to these subsets of um, ethnic cities that we see today. Um, so new ethnic cities departments emerged at various CSU and UC campuses, each attempted to add uh, new knowledge, I'm sorry, uh, regarding the history and experiences and struggles of BIPOC communities. Um, so Chicanx and Latinx studies developed this idea of borderlands theory. Um, and I'm gonna only review these for time, so don't think that you have to know these, um, you know, kind of front and back. But um, what Chicanx and Latinx studies really tried to understand is how um, brown folks were basically straddling two identities and that because of westward expansion or, you know, what we know as manifest destiny in the United States, the colonization of the U.S. of what, you know, are the former territories of Mexico. And remember that we live in um, Mexican territory uh, by default, uh, California was actually a part of Mexico at one point. Um, many of the folks who were still here when the U.S. took over, um, you know, either were expected to become fully American or, you know, were always regarded as just fundamentally Mexican. And so uh, we've seen this border identity emerge where people don't really identify with either. They can't fully be American um, because they're brown skin. Maybe they speak a Spanish tang, either in a Spanglish or just have an accent or something like that. Um, and they don't really identify with being Mexican either because in Mexico we're, you know, considered to be American, right, for that most part. So there's this kind of border that we occupy, right? And what scholars really try to do in this field was show the colonial relationship between the U.S. and Latin America. In Black, African-American, Pan-African, and Africana studies, they try to develop these various intellectual perspectives that were very African-centric or this Afrocentric kind of thinking. And this was about going back to the roots of African societies. Remember, many of these were very well developed. Um, Egypt, right? Uh, huge um, architectural and scientific advances, um, despite not really being seen as such, are actually a part of what we would consider to be the African continental epistemological or science framework, right? Um, so showed, you know, that there was this huge body of knowledge already existing there and then trying to go back to thinking about the world through that type of lens. And really what these folks tried to do was just flush out how much of society was centered around um, anti-Blackness, right? And this idea of just um, whether it be um, economics, criminal justice, politics, whatever it looks like, all of that being about um, our, um, our, uh, our kind of anti-ness towards um, Black folks or African-Americans. In terms of um, Asian studies or Asian American and API, um, they really were looking at um, these new theories around um, colonialism and what we now know as Orientalism or this uh, desire to make things foreign even though um, we don't really have a good conception of foreign. And so um, when we think about foreignness in the United States, we're always trying to other people through that. And so what I mean is when we think about uh, uh, foreign cultures, we exotify them in a way that makes them seem abnormal. And um, many of the AAPI and Asian American and Asian studies scholars tried to show that that was a part of a racist tradition, trying to show that these cultures and people were basically backwards. And because of that, that justified the um, you know, enslavement uh, or the colonization or destruction of these communities. And so 
um, what they were really helping show or helping us, you know, to see is how these Western powers were essentially um, just using Asia as a target for economic control. Um, and then you had uh, Native American indigenous study scholars looking at this idea of what we would call now call settler colonialism. And we will get into all of these um, um, concepts and ideas later on in the course. But what Native American studies scholars tried to show was that the US basically regards um, Native communities in this very um, anachronistic or in this very historical way, right? That they're not a modern um, population that has had you know, political, economic, and scientific advances rather that they're just all these feather wearing and war paint, um, you know, uh, adorned um, savages uh, as depicted in like Western movies. And that what that has done is uh, allowed for the continued um, oppression of indigenous communities. Uh, and obviously they're kind of mockery or, or the being made mockery, uh, mockery of by way of mascots, right? And we saw this with, um, for example, you know, the Cleveland Indians, um, the Washington Redskins, so on and so forth. And what these scholars try to do was actually show how much richness was here. Remember that indigenous societies were here in the US or what we now know as the continental Americas for thousands of years before conquest. Uh, we're gonna read parts of Roxanne Darn Barotis's book, Indigenous People's History of the United States. These folks had elaborate um, uh, agricultural systems, um, health systems, so on and so forth that were light years ahead of Western what we consider to be West medicine. Um, and that was all basically destroyed through colonization. Um, and again, what came out of this was this idea of critical race theory. And I wanna review it here quickly, just so you get a, a good understanding. Again, we are gonna review this over and over again throughout the semester, but CRT is a th theoretical framework that can be used to understand how the social world and social institutions impact people differently along race. It was first developed by legal or first developed as a legal theory to understand how the criminal justice system discriminated against poor people. Um, and this was called critical legal studies. And so what they realized was that in the law or in the criminal justice system, essentially, uh, rich people had the opportunity to hire lawyers and, you know, came from these particular backgrounds that weren't seen as deviant and therefore were not getting as harsh a sentence as poor people. Uh, poor people were, you know, by and large, just rounded up and, and incarcerated because they weren't able to uh, either pay bail or pay for attorneys or anything like that that would ensure their freedom. But um, there were various scholars, uh, namely Richard Delgado, Jean Stefanczyk, and uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, that argued that BIPOC communities actually face higher levels of discrimination because of their racist on white. Uh, and so that's been now applied by various scholars today, which again, we'll review over the course of the semester and really flesh that out. And what I've provided you here on the right is just so you can kind of see what Delgado, Stefanczyk and Crenshaw were thinking about. So what you can see on the top left is plea offers for felonies. Uh, and so these are um, uh, what uh, DAs, for example, will offer in, um, a uh felony, um, somebody who's been indicted with a felony um, by their race. So white folks, for example, in terms of jail time or prison, have a much lower plea offering of prison time versus African Americans. Um, here we can see distribution of prison sentences. Um, convicted whites get much less time, zero to one to 25, where you can see um, African Americans make up much more of these longer term prison sentences. Here are racial uh, disparities in terms of marijuana possession arrests, right? In the 25 most populous states. Again, African Americans having higher rates, right? And so as they saw this, right, they realized that race actually was much more instrumental. And so what that urged us to do as a scholarly field or a scholarly community was to then think about these other social institutions and understand how race was actually happening or why these um, institutions were um, uh, having these disproportionate effects or discriminating against people of color. And so where does that leave us today, right? So when we're thinking about um, race and racism, we used to have these systems of what were called um, de jure segregation and de facto segregation, right? So 
de jure segregation is, is um, segregation by law. So this was a system of laws and policies that ensured that people of color had to go to you know, their uh, respective schools, black schools, Mexican schools, uh, Asian schools, so on and so forth, so training schools, and then white school, you know, folks went to white schools. After that ended in the 1960s, we still saw it exist and actually exacerbate. And even though we had some gains in terms of busing, we really didn't see that uh, bore out in a way that was really um, inclusive or, or provided that equity needed. And so what we can see here on the top is these high segregation rates. So white students go to schools that are almost predominantly white. African-Americans are going to schools that are mostly uh, students of color, right? So African-American, Asian, and then um, Latino, and then Latino respectively the same, right? Where basically, if you think about students going, uh, students of color going to particular schools, they're going to schools that are 75%, I'm sorry, um, students of color um, and, uh, uh, you know, 25% white. And this is despite the fact that they make up smaller portions of the population. So um, Hispanic and Latino stu uh, folks in the U.S. only make up about 25 to 30 percent of the U.S. population, but they're overrepresented in these schools. African Americans actually only make up about 13 percent of the U.S. population, but they're in these, again, very hyper segregated schools. And what compounds this further in this bottom chart is that actually what we're seeing is that these schools that are predominantly black and brown are also very high poverty. So let me show this next video clip that will really explain how these differences look and what it actually is doing to students. My name is Cedric Forte. I'm a junior at Heritage High School, 425. Um, my name is Jackson Langbord. I'm 18 year old and I'm a senior at McLean High School. Academic subjects, I'm in advanced placement literature, advanced placement uh, US government, biology and comparative government, art, advanced placement music theory, health, uh, geosystems for science, and men's course leadership and technical theater. For the fun of it, trying to park here to be a minute normal time. It's really awful. You end up parking like half a mile away. The kids here are motivated in just about everything. They're motivated to even learn, which is scary to hear for a high school kid. They're motivated to succeed in sports, extracurriculars, anything. I think they've lost the will to learn. A lot of them, they just like don't find school interesting no more because they don't have the power to do anything. And you say so in the classroom. This is our auditorium theater. Uh, we have lights, standard light sound. It's not particularly high tech, but it's if you have a nice system. Yeah, go to the metal detector. Like they use this to try to, you know, keep school safe, but obviously it doesn't work because like even when someone walks through and it beeps, like they don't even search them or anything. They just say, okay, walk back through, empty your pockets. That's all they do. And that was like This is our news to dance. We're one of three high schools in the county. Who has it? Hey, orchestra, can you start playing? Well, one thing with these walls, like they really need to be repainted because of the graffiti. As you can see here, they tried to repaint it, but it doesn't blend in. You can actually tell they just like really just gave up on repainting the wall. So every teacher in this school buys their own school supplies. And it's actually very sad because like the school system should have money to, you know, provide for those school supplies for students, but they don't. And the teachers have to come out of their paycheck just to, you know, be able to support their students. Um, that's our observatory. It's just, it's a giant dome with a telescope. And you can see the entire sky from there. If every school in the country could be like McLean, I think it's really going to increase standard of living. Uh, this can make things a lot better. Obviously, it's not fair. 
So we have not even half of what they have. I mean, we're all students watching the to see the things that they have. I mean, we're all trying to learn. We're all, we all want to go up and be something. So why shouldn't we receive the same advantages they have? I don't understand. And that's the question that we face, right? It's why are we here and why is this still happening, right? And so I think what's very emblematic of this particular um, video is that there is, you know, still this very stark difference in that what we can see from the um, African-American young man here is that students of color are very disillusioned with their learning environment, right? And that, you know, obviously this more high-end school with white students, they're set up for success, right? Again, following that pattern of, of segregated education. And so what we really see is, again, you know, these kind of persistent issues, K-12 schools and curriculum really still adequately or fail to adequately include and discuss and represent communities of color. And they do this, although there has been, you know, some changes, I will say, and I've been working with school districts, school districts on this in terms of some consulting work that I do on the side. Um, but what we've seen is a kind of negligence or just outright dismissal of these problems. And what I've provided you here on the right is some um, important information. So one, we can see the diversity in children's books, um, you know, people of color being very underrepresented compared to, you know, kind of animals and inanimate objects, and then white students here. The right, these charts are actually um, come from the Southern Poverty Law Center. They did an extensive study on um, incidents, incidents of harassment after immediately after the Trump administration or the Trump election, I'm sorry, in 2016. And what they found is that California had one of the highest rates that were mostly happening in K-12 schools and the types of harassment were mostly anti-black and anti-immigrant. And if we remember, um, despite where you fall in the political aisle is that you know there was a lot of overt race talk by um, the former president and you know, members of his administration. And what that led to was schools actually having very high rates of um, harassment happening. I mean, there are still schools pre-pandemic that where folks were finding nooses, swastikas on campus. We've had neo-Nazi groups demonstrate there. Um, obviously the um, Unite the Right March happened at a campus in North Carolina. And so that's been a big part of this long history of race and racism, which has been, you know, kind of urging and motivating the ethnic studies movement for the past, you know, 60 years. Um, alongside this, we've seen a major defunding in education and public schools specifically. Um, so more and more schools are losing money. That's been a, a change, you know, thankfully under the uh, Biden administration and the Newsom administration at the statewide level. Um, most urban schools have lost money where we have these high student color populations. Uh, they've been diverted to charter schools and private schools. And um, likewise, um, we've seen universities and um, colleges also lose uh, funding sources. And that's been part of the reason why your tuition is so high. I remember when I was a community college student, I believe I paid $18 a unit. Um, you know, it was a couple, like about $100 to take um, a class or so, you know, and now it's well over a couple hundred dollars to take a, a community college course and, you know, several thousand dollars to take a university one. And so, again, we're still seeing these persistent issues, the defunding, the lack of meaningful inclusion of um, students of color's background, like in these spaces, which again is motivating this whole project of ethnic studies. Um, Further compounding this is this idea of the schools to prison pipeline, which you may have heard of. Um, we've seen a lot of outsourcing of um, uh, resources or uh, outsourcing of, of disciplinary policies towards um, policing, um, which has had some really deleterious effects. Um, students of color have a two to three times higher suspension and expulsion rate, which has led obviously to that high dropout rate. Um, many uh, folks incarcerated today do not have a high school diploma and there's been a strong or there's been strong evidence or a strong correlation between um, incarceration and lack of education so much so that one in three black men will be incarcerated in their life and one in three one in six Latino men will be incarcerated in their life. 
Um, I just want to show a one last quick video that will encapsulate this that will really talk about the schools of prison pipeline and then we'll get into some of the more good stuff about ethnic studies. might hear in the news sometimes, the school to prison pipeline. It's shorthand for how schools are funneling students, especially black students, into the criminal justice system. It started in the 90s when schools responded to fears about crime with zero tolerance policies, which mandated suspensions and expulsions for certain violations. They also cracked down on little things like talking back or uniform violations. The hope was that it would keep bigger problems from bubbling up, but as a result, out-of-school suspensions have doubled since the 1970s, and they keep increasing, even though juvenile crime rates have now been dropping for years. Around the same time, the number of police officers stationed full-time inside schools has increased by a third between 1997 and 2007. Ostensibly, they were there to prevent mass school shootings, like the one at Columbine, but they end up being a way for schools to basically outsource discipline to the police. Schools with officers have five times as many arrests for disorderly conduct as schools without them. Sometimes the results are shocking. But the less visible effect is that schools are feeding the racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Consider the fact that schools are more likely to have an officer on their campus if the student population is more than 50% Black. You might assume that that's because there's more crime at these schools, but although students at police schools are more likely to be arrested, they're not actually more likely to be charged in court for weapons, drugs, alcohol, or assault, at least according to one study. During the 2010-2011 school year, one in six public school students in the U.S. were Black, but they accounted for one in three arrests at school. Same goes for other forms of school discipline. Black students are suspended or expelled three times more frequently than white students. It actually begins in preschool. 18% of preschoolers are Black. But of all preschoolers suspended more than once, 48% are Black. Studies show that differences in behavior can't fully account for these disparities. Black students and white students are sent to the principal's office at similar rates, but Black students are more likely to end up with a serious punishment. One study found that white students are more likely to be suspended for provable offenses like smoking or vandalism. Black students are more likely to be suspended for subjective offenses like talking back or insubordination. Students who are suspended in school are more likely to later drop out or get arrested. So the federal government is asking schools to make suspension and expulsion the absolute last resort. So clearly, again, more on this dehumanizing education that students of color are facing. And we're seeing this kind of bore out here in this particular example with the schools of prison pipeline being these black and brown students uh, being suspended at higher rates and removed from schools at much higher rates, right? So, so what we have seen is this kind of long and leaky pipeline, right? So for uh, what we see here on the left from the uh, Chicano Studies Research Center out of UCLA is the uh, educational um, trajectory of 100 students per racial ethnic group, right? So Latinos, whites, Asian Americans, African Americans, and Native Americans. And this is what I was talking about earlier in terms of how few folks like me end up getting a PhD. For every 100 Latino students, only less than 1% of those actually make it to the doctorate. And what that has done has been, you know, it takes about 300 elementary school students to make one of me, right? Compared to at least three doctoral candidates coming out of white communities, right? And obviously less for African Americans and Native Americans. And it's been largely because they've had this very problematic education system that has you know, either kicked them out before they've even made it out or has sent them into what are considered open access schools like what we go to here at um, LBCC, a, uh, a non-selective school versus a UC or a CSU, which again is gonna have more resources and, and supports to make sure that students are academically successful. And so that has put the state on a path towards mandating ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. This has been something that we've been mulling over for the past uh, five to six years now. Uh, we actually approved 
um, a statewide adoptable ethnic studies program for K-12 schools back in 2016. And every year since then, there has been some iteration of the graduation requirement. The only one that's come close so far has been AB 1460, which again mandated ethnic studies as a graduation requirement um, for the uh, California Community Colleges and the California State University system. However, we still have not seen um, the K-12 graduation requirement move forward. Um, there is talk that this year might be the year that we get it through. However, that graduation requirement would not be fully mandated or fully instituted until the 2029-2030 academic year, which is a few years off. So we're still behind the ball on that. And why is this important, right? So a lot of research um, in, in and on ethnic studies has really showed great outcomes. And when you watch um, Precious Knowledge next week, we're really going to see this in a much more visceral sense through the folks who were at the Tucson Unified uh, Mexican American Studies program. But research on that and other school sites that have been institutionalizing ethnic studies have seen massive gains. So students who take these courses have greater GPA outcomes, a one to two point increase. So let's say if they had a 3.0, they have a 4.0. If they have a 2.0, maybe they jump up to a 4.0, so on and so forth. Attendance rates go up, you know, 80 to 90 percent. Um, credit completion rates go up on average about 23 credits. Um, student off on and off campus engagement goes up, graduation rates go up, college aspiration and matriculation. So not only the sense of wanting to go to college, but actually going to college goes up. And this has not been explored as much in the community college space, but I guesstimation if we really did a comprehensive study of ethnic studies here in our system or at LBCC is that students who take these courses are much more likely to transfer um, and actually even aspire to be ethnic studies majors once they start to take these courses. What I have seen though is ethnic studies have real impacts on students in campuses. And so this actually comes from my research. Again, I, I spent a year in an ethnic studies classroom watching students produce um, or work in this environment to a really great effect. So I actually coined a new term called academic familismo uh, from folks taking these courses. And what academic familismo taught me was that these courses bring students together into these learning communities where they want to do work to celebrate and honor who they are, right, in their cultural backgrounds, but also are very invested in um, supporting their peers. And what that does is it reframes um, education from a very um, capitalistic and competitive environment to one of communityality that we all want to be successful together and celebrate who we are, which we can see in this example of folks doing a Dia de los Muertos presentation where they made these little uh, michos or shoebox altars. Um, here in this World Cafe activity, which we will do some um, projects similar to this in our uh, in our uh, participation activities, um, we see students uh, create, we have very creative and very engaged responses to questions working together side by side. Obviously this is pre-pandemic, which is why they're not masked or socially distant. Um, but again, you know, very, very diverse uh, and very, very uh, awesome um, uh, engagement with this um, learning activity. And then, you know, last but not least, you know, we see it again here with this artisanry and engagement um, in their classes where they're really doing some awesome work there. And um, if you're ever interested in learning more about this, I'd be happy to share some of my dissertation work. But what I will really stress is that these ethnic city students in this ethnic studies class created an, an enriching environment where these students are still, you know, um, on the path of education. Many of them have gone on to um, community college or to universities and are doing great things there trying to um, you know, become young academics or become professionals in their own right. So I'm gonna wrap it there. So again, what we've covered today is the context for the start of the ethnic studies movement. Again, thinking about that segregated education and all of the issues with it, the emergence of third world, the third world liberation front and ethnic studies new ethnic studies epistemologies, and then that kind of research focus. Remember, we saw the different subfields, what they were doing, uh, and what the kind of um, uh, aim of those, uh, you know, Asian American studies, Latin American studies, so on and so forth were doing. 
um, the current battle for ethnic cities in K-12 or in California, those laws and policies in the terrain, including also data supporting why these courses are important in terms of how they have better outcomes for students. Um, and then our key terms today, right? We learned about epistemology, this theory of knowledge production and interpretation. And lastly, critical race theory uh, or a theoretical framework that can be used to understand the social world and social institutions and how they impact people differently along race. Again, we will um, think more about critical race theory um, over the course. So, um, you know, review these, re uh, read the Miguel Zavala reading. I think it's very good. Um, this shouldn't be too much heavy lifting for you. Um, what I will say after you finish this lecture and, and going forward thinking about other ones is watch these in chunks, you know, as it, it pertains, um, they will be, you know, about an hour or so, but it's gonna be chock full of information that's important. So, you know, take this and digest it slowly so that way you can process the material. If you have questions, always feel free to email me, set up an office hours appointment, stop by my office, let's talk some more. And I look forward to hearing your insights about what you learned today.